In this overview, you and I get to take a look at some of the common networking devices that we'd often find in local and wide area networks, including all the cabling types that connect them all together. And here in this topology diagram, we have a few icons. We're familiar probably with many of them, including a computer, and this represents the computer that's using wireless. These two computers are connected into a switch, and that's the icon for a switch right there, switch one, switch two. Here's a printer. Here are some servers, one down here and a couple up here. And then we have a router and a firewall. This device right here is an access point. And before we start getting into the details of what each of those specific components do and how they work, I think it'd be super important to do a quick refresher and a recap regarding the TCP IP protocol stack and the information that's included at each of the respective layers, including layer four, the transport layer, and layer three, the network layer, and layer two, the data link layer. And spoiler alert, the reason that's important to realize what goes into these headers here at each of the layers is because based on the type of network device, that's the information that they'll be using to make forwarding decisions. So for this scenario, let's use computer one that's going to a secure website here on a server out on the internet. And let's imagine that web server is 23.1.2.4, that's its IP address. And let's imagine that computer one for this discussion is 10.1.0.51. So in preparation for that being successful, the user's here at their computer, they have the browser open, and as they go to the secure website, behind the scenes, the application layer service that's being used is HTTPS. And I'll color code these so we can match them up as well. Also, before that information is sent out on the network, the computer is also going to include TCP information. That'd be part of the layer four information here, the transport layer. And we're using TCP because HTTPS uses TCP at the transport layer. And also all the data in the transport layer that's included there can be said to be in the TCP header. In fact, that's also true for the network layer and the data link layer. As we add information to each of these layers, the information that's contained can be said to be part of the header for that layer. So in the TCP portion or the TCP header, it's gonna have the destination port of 443, because that's the well-known port for a secure web server. It's also gonna have a source port. So for the source port, the computer just picked one that was free at that moment. And so in our previous set of videos, when we were looking at this, it randomly chose the port 35,782, and that information would be included in the TCP header information. And actually here for the TCP header information, I'm gonna put the source first followed by the destination. In my brain, logically it works better that way. So I'll jot down that the source port is that high numbered port, 35,782, and the destination port is the well-known port for HTTPS services, which is 443. Then before that traffic is sent out on the wire, it also needs to include, meaning computer one needs to include, as part of the protocol stack, it needs to include the source and destination IP addresses. And that's at layer three, that's the network layer information. So I'll color code that as well. So here at layer three, the IP information would be the source address of this computer at 10.1.0.51. And the destination would be this server down here, which is 23.1.2.4. This computer also needs to include, before it sends the data into the network, it needs to include the layer two information as well. So I'm gonna kind of put this in a dark yellow to represent layer two here. And that is the layer two information. And with the layer two addresses, that refers to the layer two ethernet addresses, the MAC addresses that are being used for this first little leg of our journey. And so computer one, the source MAC address, I'm just gonna put computer one as the source MAC address. And the destination is not gonna be the destination layer two address of the server way out here on the internet, but rather the next device in the path, which is the default gateway right here. So the destination is gonna be the MAC address of this router right here. So I'll write gateway slash router. Then once that information is all ready to go, then computer one at layer one spits it on the network. So it's using its network interface card and it's sending out the bits of data. So the layers are layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, and the application layer. So one of the questions that might come up and that we discussed or touched on in our previous set of videos is, what if uh, this computer, computer one, doesn't know the IP address of www.server.com. It doesn't know that it's 23.1.2.4. How in the world can it include it? The answer is it's gonna pause for a few milliseconds and it's gonna use another application layer service called DNS and find out. So it may stop the process before it talks to the server, do a quick DNS request to a DNS server, get that information, then continue on. There's also the question of at layer two, if this computer is putting the source MAC address of itself and the destination MAC address of its default gateway, how did computer one actually know the MAC address of the router's interface? And the answer is 
it's going to use a little feature called ARP. And we touched on both of those in our previous set of videos. But those are two dynamic methods that are used by a computer to learn stuff. DNS to learn the IP address of a destination host. And ARP, Address Resolution Protocol, is used locally on the same local area network to find the Layer 2 address of another local device. In this case, Computer 1 needed the local Layer 2 address of its default gateway, so it can include that as part of the Layer 2 information. Or another way of saying that is to include it inside of the Layer 2 header. Another fun way of thinking about this TCP IP protocol stack is to use a representation. So I've got here some cups. So this green cup represents the application layer. Think of it like a user who wants to go to a secure website using HTTPS. HTTPS is the application layer payload that's being communicated back and forth between the client and the server, or that's intended to be communicated. Now, HTTPS is going to use a transport layer protocol. So in the case of HTTPS, it uses TCP at the transport layer in this header, that would include the source and destination TCP ports. And then the computer also is going to include the network information, layer three, which would include the source and destination layer three information, effectively the IP addressing for the source, the computer that's sending the request, and the destination, the server that's being connected to. And then before that data is sent out on the network, there's also a layer two header included, and that's going to include the computer's local MAC address and the next top device's MAC address. So on a local network, it would be the computer's layer two source MAC address, and the destination on that local network would be the default gateway's layer two address. And then finally, that information can be spit out on the network, which allows the network to go ahead and forward that traffic. Now here's the takeaway. The data link layer information, the layer two information, that's used by layer two switches. Local area network switches look at that layer two information regarding destination MAC addresses to make forwarding decisions. And routers, IP routers, they look at layer three information. They're looking at IP addresses and the destination addresses there to make their forwarding decisions. And so that's why it matters what information is included at which layers is because switches use layer two information and routers use layer three information to make their forwarding decisions. Another interesting note is that there's different terms for the data inside of the TCP protocol stack at different levels. For example, if we're looking at the data, which includes all the way down to the data link layer, we could refer to that as a frame of data. If we're looking at the TCP IP protocol stack and data, and we're looking at the layer three information, we could refer to that as a packet. And if we're looking at layer four, that can be referred to as a segment. Now, don't take that too literally if you just have a casual conversation with somebody. So if they say frame of data when they're talking about IP routing, or they talk about a packet of data when they're talking about layer two switching, it's okay, it's just among friends. But behind the scenes, this can help give clarity regarding what we're talking about. So when the data is finally sent into the switch, the switch is looking at the layer two addresses to make a forwarding decision. And as a result, it would forward from computer one through the switched environment here to router one. And then router one would receive it and router one's an IP router. So it would look at the layer three information and it would say, oh, this packet is destined for 23.1.2.4. I'll go ahead and forward it in that direction. At that point, these next devices would get it and forward it appropriately, or hopefully forward it appropriately in the direction of the actual server so that the server can get the request. So we could say that local area network switches are focusing on forwarding frames of data based on the layer two destination address, the MAC addresses involved in that layer two header, and IP routers are focused on the information in the layer three header, specifically the destination IP address to make their forwarding decisions. Also, this is an access point. It is gonna be wired into the network, and that is the device, the wireless radio device that allows access from wireless clients. So a client would interact with an access point to get access to the rest of the network. Also behind the scenes, most Cisco environments are also going to use what's called a wireless LAN controller or wireless controller for short. And the benefit of using a controller is that you and I can log into the controller and then the controller can interact with let's say a dozen or a hundred access points. And that way we don't have to go into each and every single access point one by one to manage them and work with them. We can work with the controller and the controller can interact and work with the access points. I'd also love to chat with you about a few of the subtleties regarding wide area network communications as well. Back in the old days, like going back a decade or two decades ago, when I first got into networking with Cisco, we used serial interfaces, serial adapters on our routers that would connect to a service provider network, which would give us access to wherever we wanted to connect. For example, we could connect our branch office through a router there with a serial connection that went to the same service provider. So we can have a fairly slow speed relative to our high speeds here in the local area network, a relatively slow speed WAN connection. 
that our service provider is making possible. So the biggest difference between a local area network, which is high speed and super fast, and a WAN is usually geography, where we're using a service provider and we're paying for an additional logical circuit or physical circuit between our location and another site. However, it's more likely today if we need to get connectivity from our site here to a branch office, instead of doing a serial interface, our service provider over the existing network or through a separate network can build a logical path between our site and the branch office using an ethernet port on both sides. And then they do the magic of making it happen. Or another option is to simply have internet connectivity from both sites and then have a virtual private network built between those two sites, the headquarters site here on the left and this branch office to provide that connectivity. So whether we're using an ethernet port provided by the service provider or we have a little serial interface that's connecting to the provider, the logical point where our gear and the provider's gear connects, that can be referred to as a demark or a demarcation point or a telco termination point. So if we're trying to identify if it's our problem or the service provider's problem, the telco termination point or that demarcation point is the dividing line where those two come together. I hope this has been informative and I'd like to thank you for viewing.